Welcome, everyone. I'm Mira Wasserman, the director of the Center for Jewish Ethics at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. And in a moment, I'll have the opportunity to introduce today's lecturer. Those of you who have been with us during previous weeks know that this lecture series comes from a partnership between the Center for Jewish Ethics and the Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. We are grateful for a grant from the Campaign for Community from Penn's Office of the Provost and for support from the SNF PIDEA program at Penn. I thank all the staff at the CAT Center for all of their work on this series. Later in this hour, you will meet Professor Steve Weitzman, Director of the CAT Center, and Dr. Ann Albert, the CAT Center's Director of Public Programs, who will participate in the Q&A session following the lecture. A few logistical announcements. You will be able to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to share questions and comments throughout our time together. We will do our best to bring as many of your questions as we can to the lecturer at the end of our at the end of the hour. Please know that there is also a live transcript closed captioning feature that you can activate if it is coming up and you do not want it, you, it's in your ability to turn it off. Also, for those of you who would like to further engage with today's topic following our hour together, we invite you to visit the website that accompanies this lecture series and we're putting a link to it in the chat. Uh, within the next day, we will post questions for reflection and discussion based on today's lecture and we'll put them there on that page. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our lecturer for today, Professor Mark Dollinger. Professor Dollinger holds the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Endowed Chair in Jewish Studies and Social Responsibility at San Francisco State University. He is the author of four scholarly books in American Jewish history, most recently, Black Power, Jewish Politics, Reinventing the Alliance in the 1960s. It is this work that he will be speaking on today, and that has made him such a go-to expert on where Jews fit into the struggle against racism in recent months and years. An accomplished historian who has published entries in the Encyclopedia Judaica, the Encyclopedia of Antisemitism, and the Encyclopedia of African American Education, Professor Dollinger does not shy away from stepping into the fray. His next project traces his own experience fighting campus anti-Semitism at both right-wing and left-wing universities. Professor Dollinger has spoken about his research in a to a wide array of audiences, appearing on Don Lemon's CNN podcast, Silence is Not an Option, as well as the NFL Network and ESPN. Just for fun, Dr. Dollinger helped actress Helen Hunt learn about her Jewish roots on the primetime NBC show, Who Do You Think You Are? Professor Dollinger has a gift for bringing the fun to his teaching, even as he challenges students of history to grapple with the profound ethical challenges of making meaning and making a difference. It is a real delight to be able to introduce him to all of you today Welcome, Professor Dollinger. Thanks so much, and it's uh, great to be at Penn, uh, even if virtually. Uh, to get us started today, I'm going to uh, share the screen here. Um, today, we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about history, historiography, and historical memory. All right, to help us with the definitions. We start with the easiest question of all, history. History is the study of the past. The more challenging, especially for the history majors amongst us, is historiography. Even if we have a few English majors here, this is the key part of historiography, that word graph in the middle of it. This is the history of historical writing. Historiography um, tells the story of how different generations of academic historians will look at the same event through their own lens. 
So today we're gonna to look at blacks and Jews, Jews and race and the civil rights movement. And we're gonna do it um, by looking at the history of how earlier generations of scholars have approached the subject um, and how I am now, the study of how historians have studied the past. Really, I think the most pointed part of today's presentation is about historical memory. As it turns out, what we think happened in history and what actually happened in history can often be different. And the job of the academic historian is to go into the archives, look at the sources um, and determine, you know, the ways in which um, our popular understanding of the past may not actually mesh with what actually occurred. So for that, let's just get started with the 25th letter of the alphabet, but it also is for me, especially for the visual learners out there, a representation of the first historiographic generation of writing on the relationship between white Jews and blacks. And, uh, and here's how it goes. According to this telling, we'll put white Jews over here at the top left. Uh, we'll put uh, black community here on the right. And you can see that they're apart. But over time, look, they come together in the middle. This is the civil rights movement. This is that famous picture of pictures of Heschel and King. And then you see here that, that white Jews and blacks are marching together throughout history into destiny. At least that's the idea. So no matter what book you would read from the first generation of historical writing on this topic, it's going to be this letter Y. And it's going to be rooted in one of three arguments. The first we call the history argument. And that's to say that um, white Jews and blacks have a similar history, sadly, of oppression. So it makes perfect sense for them to come together, you know, in solidarity in the civil rights movement. The second is a related argument, the sociology argument, that um, white Jews and blacks share the feeling of marginalization in society. And when you have two outsider groups who know what it's like to be outsiders, then naturally, like the why here, they're gonna to come together and march together in peace. And the third is the religion argument, Judaism. Tikkun olam, which is the word we're using now to repair the world, mandates Jews according to the prophetic tradition to be involved in social justice causes. So if you put history, sociology, and Judaism together, you get the letter Y. But there's a problem with that historiographic school. In the mid 60s, the alliance broke apart with the rise ultimately of the black power movement. The letter Y doesn't tell the story as well as let's say the letter X. Yeah, here it is, white Jews up here, blacks here, they're apart. They come together in the middle of the X from about 1954, Brown decision, Montgomery bus boycott, till what, 1964, Civil Rights Act, 1965, Voting Rights Act. And sadly, in the years since, the communities have come apart. And um, hopefully today, um, maybe we're not you know, this far apart, maybe things are coming together. And as we'll talk about later, the experience of Jews of color and black Jews in particular, is gonna complicate all of this narrative and all of this historiography. Um, focusing though, at least on uh, the white Jews who have been the subject of historical inquiry up till now, um, the X has been, has, has been the way we've understood it. And the X challenges those three assumptions. While it's true that, um, Jews have suffered anti-Semitism. The history of Jews in America and the history of um, Blacks in America couldn't be more different. In fact, the history argument breaks down when we look at the US experience. Second, sociology. Um, it turned out that Jews did not join the civil rights movement until after World War II, until after white Jews had been admitted into the middle class into the suburbs, the ones that used to exclude both Jews and Blacks um, prior. So if it turns out that Blacks and Jews shared marginalization, 
then they wouldn't have waited, as it turns out, um, until Jews became white, as the phrase goes, um, to come together. And perhaps the most challenging for our understanding, for our historical memory, is um, the fact that if Judaism demands social justice work, specifically anti-Black racism work, right, against racism, then um, we would expect the Orthodox community to be in the lead. As it turns out, the Orthodox community was the least represented amongst Jews engaged in civil rights. Um, there were some conservative movement Jews, of course, Rabbi Heschel, the most famous, yet he was all but excommunicated from his own seminary for doing what he did. The reform movement was really the leader among the denominations, especially the Religious Action Center, the RAC, yet most of the Jewish activists who went south were not going south as part of Jewish organizations. They were joining secular groups, civil rights groups, leftist groups. And, and for this, it really undermines even the second generation of historical writing to try to figure out um, what's going on. So what we're gonna do today um, is uh, take a journey, um, a third round, right? A new historiographic interpretation of blacks and Jews in order to figure out um, what's exactly happening. We're gonna do this in the form of a pop quiz. But since we're on webinar format, um, if you're watching with somebody and you know the answer, shout out the answer to your friend. If not, just shout it out to the screen um, and, and we can see how you're doing. I'm gonna give you a historical quote. I've done three things to the quote though. First, I've removed um, the name of the author of the quote. Second, I have removed the date the quote was, was set or written. Your job is to guess who said it and when. All right, now here's the third thing I did. I did this talk at the Hartman Institute back when we could travel and they're very smart. And they know that African-Americans um, have had different names associated, Afro-American, Black, Negro over time. And they were able to date the quote by what word was used. All right, that's very smart, but it's cheating. So um, I've broken the historian's rule. I changed the documents, so I mixed it all up so you can have no confidence in dating the document that way. So with that, here is our first document. And it says, Black power stresses Black initiative, Black self-worth, Black identity, Black pride. Black power seeks the growth and development of Black economic and political power. Black power seeks Black leadership development. Who said it? All right, as you're thinking about who said it, I'll tell you, I was sitting in the archives and um, um, this was the American Jewish Historical Society in, uh, in Lower Manhattan. And uh, it was pretty clear to me, this had to be a black power activist, right? Um, well, first I thought of Malcolm X. I thought of Stokely Carmichael, who was the founder of the black power movement because these are the words that the organizer or supporter of black power would say. Okay, here's our reveal. Let's look at a picture of, of Malcolm or Stokely. Oh wait, no, it's the American Jewish Committee from 1969. How could that be? Okay, this is a shocker in the archives. We do not expect the American Jewish Committee, which is a national Jewish self-defense organization, very well known, very highly regarded, um, but we don't expect the AJC to be making such a positive statement about black power and to be doing it in 1969, which was really a time of great distress between the black and white Jewish communities. So here's how it works historiographically. As a scholar sitting in the archive looking at this document, realizing that this is an AJC statement, there's something not being told. There's gotta be a backstory to help us understand how this could be. Okay, let's go to our second text. Now, this is actually just a straight up question. How would the uh, Anti-Defamation League respond to the rise of the nation of Islam. The ADL, as you probably know, is the nation's leading Jewish organization fighting against anti-Semitism. 
And as you probably know, the Nation of Islam, which is Louis Farrakhan now, Malcolm X before, Elijah Muhammad before that, has been throughout its history quite anti-Semitic. So it seems like a rather obvious answer, right? How would the ADL respond to the Nation of Islam? In a really negative way. And of course, you can probably figure out where this is going. The historiography would tell us it would have to be a negative reaction. The sources tell a different story. It turned out in 1959, Time Magazine wrote an, a feature article on Elijah Muhammad, who was then the leader of the Nation of Islam. Um, it was what you call in journalism a hit piece. It, it really spoke ill of him in every possible way. It called him an anti-Semite, of course. And, uh, and when I was sitting in the archives, I came across a memo. And the memo said, confidential, not for publication. And the content of the memo was so incredible that I was actually quite disappointed that it said I couldn't publish it because I said, this is absolutely for publication. I learned a little bit about the ethics of the archives. It turns out I did have permission to publish it, which means I do have permission to show you what it said. This is what the leader of the ADL, Arnold Forster, said to all of his regional um, officers across the country. He wrote, Time Magazine notwithstanding, we have no documentable evidence of anti-Semitism on the part of the Temples of Islam movement or Elijah Muhammad. How could that be? How could the leader of the ADL face anti-Semitic statements in a national magazine, and one, tell every one of his branch offices it's not true, and two, do that secretly, right? With a stamp at the top, don't tell anyone I said this, you know, let's just keep quiet about the whole thing. Um, by the way, this turned out to be chapter one of the book, right? About half of chapter one is, is a new historiographic understanding of how Jewish organizations responded to the nation of Islam. All right, so I hope folks are getting a little, um, you know, getting your, your historical memory a, a, a little bit put out of position here. Uh, let's look at our next quote. Um, the longstanding African-American distrust of white people, born of oppression, is manifesting itself in a growing spirit of go it alone. Blacks were already, this person said, reevaluating their alliances and had come to know their strength in the political and economic arenas. The person who wrote this predicted a period of mutual irritation and misunderstanding, followed by a spike in new and more active forms of black anti-Semitism. This was a public statement. It actually came out you know, in, in, a, in a periodical, which anyone could possibly read. And um, all right, so I, I thought this was a pretty smart and insightful, turned out of course to be correct assessment of uh, the black Jewish relationship. And here's who said it and when. Nathan Edelstein from the ADL in 1960. And here's the key to this document. It's this 1960 part. You see in the historiography, in historical memory, the way we learn it is the interracial alliance was great marching arm in arm. You know, everything was great until until unfortunately, right? Black militancy, black power, anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, they all peak in the mid 1960s and ruined the relationship. Well, if it turns out that five years before any of that, in 1960, when by all public purposes, the alliance was strong and interracial harmony was good and there was no trouble, at least we thought there was no trouble. We find out that a national Jewish leader said there's longstanding, and, and he used the word Negro at that point, a distrust of white people born of oppression is manifesting itself in a growing spirit of go it alone. This Jewish leader understood anti-black oppression. He understood that there is a need for black autonomy in civil rights and in racial justice go it alone. And when he said that Blacks were reevaluating their alliances, um, that's code, right, for the Black Jewish Alliance. 
1960, Jewish leadership knew the alliance was going to end and they were writing about it publicly. In fact, he says, there's gonna be mutual irritation, there's gonna be misunderstanding, and, and here it is, anti-Semitism is on its way, which means when we get to the mid 60s and we get to all of the you know, horrendous um, splits that occurred between the communities, we can't locate the cause of that in the mid 1960s. And we can't locate it um, in the rise of black militancy and the rise of black power. And most importantly, even white Jewish civil rights leaders understood it. So let's keep diving in the archives, shall we? What's next? Okay. I am tired of the philanthropy of rich white men towards your race. I wanna see you fight your own battles with your own leaders and your own money. We white men of whatever creed or faith cannot fight your battles for you. We will stand shoulder to shoulder with you until you can fight as generals all by yourselves. Now, back in the day when we could travel, um, I would break everyone into groups and each group would get their own quote. So they wouldn't know, you know that all of the quotes are supposed to bring the correct, incorrect answer, right? And you're all probably now trying to figure out who it, who it really was compared to who you think it is. So playing along here, this says we white men. So we know it was a white man who said it. And okay, you can figure out it's a Jewish white man um, because it's this particular talk. Um, and uh, let's see, let's see who it was. Joel Springarn, 1914. Joel Springarn, the founder or a co-founder of the NAACP with his brother, Arthur and W.B. Du Bois, the first African-American to earn the PhD from Harvard. Here's what's critical about this quote. It's given in 1914, Springarn speaking before an African-American audience. And he says to them, I'm tired of the philanthropy of rich white men towards your race. He's criticizing himself. He says like, I understand that I have enjoy the privilege, right? That I can give you this money, but uh, even I understand, right, that I need to see you fight your own battles with your own leaders and your own money. Now, the truth is even in 1914, and in fact, even in times of slavery, there has always been black resistance to systemized oppression, to slavery, to Jim Crow. Um, and we're beginning to see in the beginning of the 20th century, you know, sort of white allyship um, picking up in new ways. But even with the role of white allies, um, Springarn, is understanding that um, it's not his place, right, to try to control black liberation. So he writes here, or he says, we white men of whatever creed or faith cannot fight your battles for you. We will stand shoulder to shoulder with you until you can fight as generals all by yourselves. So this quote, I think really is relevant to the historiography. It's also relevant to so much of, of our white Jewish historical memory. Um, around sort of the idea of, of, of what roles were played and not played. And ultimately, if Springarn in 1914 um, is announcing what happened in 1964, then nobody should be surprised, right, by the breakup of the alliance and by the dynamics. And more importantly, we have to look at different causes. We have to, we have to explore um, American Jewish history in different ways in order to align it much more um, with what scholars in African American history have been studying, you know, throughout their careers. So here's a here's another surprise, you know, for the from the book in the presentation. It was not initially um, a book on the Black Power movement of the Jews. This was the first working title, Turning Inward, because I had noticed that in the late '60s and in the 1970s. American Jews became more public and more activist in their Jewish identities, in their Jewish education um, and in Jewish culture and in Jewish politics. And I wanted to write a book to figure out where the inspiration for all of this renewed interest in Jewishness came. So that's when I started going into the archives. And early on, I found this quote. Perhaps the saddest element in this whole frightening picture is in the fact that Jews are the people who are best able to understand the rhetoric of black power, 
even though they're most directly on the firing line of its attack. So let's look at this quote. All right, let's start with this whole frightening picture. All right, so there is something going on that's evoking fear um, around black power. So I'm gonna date this like in the mid sixties, maybe in the late sixties. Um, I, I want a time at which most of white Jewish America felt frightened because they didn't like what was going on with black power. And here we have a quote that says, there's something sad going on in this frightening picture. And what's sad is, and this is, this is what shocked me, this person said Jews are the people who are best able to understand black power, even though they're most directly on the firing line of its attack. That was a wow. This is a person who knows that, that Jews are being victimized, right? In this case, by anti-Semitism among some in, in, the, in the black community, that, that there's a frightening picture, but that there's sadness here. So, you know, I thought maybe this be some radical Jewish leftist. Um, maybe it would be some black leader trying to trying to reach out. Um, turned out to be rather Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg, Columbia University professor, conservative movement rabbi, former congregational rabbi, uh, wrote so many books. Probably the most famous is the Zionist Idea. When I read Hertzberg's quote, it actually set up for me the entire book. This essentially Unwinding this sentence became the challenge. Perhaps the saddest element in this whole frightening picture is in the fact that Jews are the people who are best able to understand the rhetoric of black power, even though they're most directly on the firing line of its attack. He was onto something. He was alerting his fellow Jews that there was a deeper truth happening that Jews were not seeing and that made him sad, right? So that for me said, I gotta figure out what that deeper thing was going on, what made Rabbi Hertzberg sad and how this can help us better understand the history, how it can challenge the historiography. And then I found this quote. The positive aspect of black power is its search for ethnic identity. This we should be able to understand and approve. The American black today is in this respect retracing precisely the experience of American Jews a generation or two ago. Who said this? Rabbi Roland Gittleson, Temple Israel Boston Reform Movement, 1969. Let's go back to the quote. First, the positive aspect of black power. He's, oh, this is, by the way, this is a, a sermon that he gave. Um, the, the first sentence opens, there's a positive aspect of black power. Nowhere in my historical memory, nowhere when I was growing up and learning this stuff or when I was reading the earlier historical literature, did I think there was any positive aspect for black power if you're taking it from a white Jewish perspective, you know? And here, Rabbi Gittleson says, it's a search for ethnic identity. And that was key. This we, and then the dot, dot, dot is Jews. This we Jews should be, be able to understand and approve. Rabbi Gittleson not only finds black power positive, he finds it understandable. And he is calling on his congregants to approve a black power. Um, and let me get check the date, 1969. That was a pretty intense time to do that. And uh, this is even more stunning. The American black today, he said Negro at the time, is in this respect retracing precisely the experience of American Jews a generation or two ago. Not only isn't black power like objectionable and all that, you know, and responsible for the end of the alliance, not only is it positive, understandable, approving, but in fact, it's Jewish. He paralleled the American Jewish experience with the black power experience. And, uh, and he said it publicly in 1969. And for this, I was like, okay, this, you know, this, we're on to something here to figure it out. 
And this is what made Rabbi Gittleson even um, more important. In 1948, Harry S. Truman created the White House Commission on Civil Rights, the first federal effort really since World War II, of course. And he invited Rabbi Gittleson to join, which meant Rabbi Gittleson was really the first um, rabbi on a national level to get engaged in post-war civil rights work. And uh, in the 50s and 60s, he encouraged his young people to travel south. And in fact, um, some of them were arrested and sent to the prison in Parchman, Mississippi. Um, and he was writing letters and making phone calls back and forth with the Mississippi rabbis, you know, to get messages back and forth to the kids. If there was a break between sort of the good old days of the civil rights movement when everybody was arm in arm and, and you know, what I lovingly call the peace, love and Bobby Sherman phase, when, when, every, when, you know, when, when everyone you know, seemed to love one another, right, um, was, was all good. He should be the one most upset that that came to an end. He should be the one to see black power as ending a good thing. He should be the one buying into those earlier historiographic schools of interpretation. Yet, he's the one in the lead supporting, defending, and advancing Black power. If you look just at Rabbi Gittleson's own approach to this from 1948 to the 50s and 60s, and then to Black power and after, um, I think we can actually chart an entirely new history, or at least an entirely new understanding of the history. And, uh, and this is where it led. And, I, and, and so now, now I'll give you the big reveal, right? As I'm reading through all of, all of these rabbis and, and other Jewish leaders who are complimenting Black power for its ethnic pride, for its willingness to be public in expression, to defend yourselves, to engage in what we now call identity politics, um, brought me back to a funny story when I was researching my first book. Um, I was studying the freedom rights and I went to the card catalog, that's what we used to call them then. And the card catalog um, said Freedom Ride 1971, which is a typographical error because the Freedom Rides were a decade earlier, but uh, you know, that can happen. So I pulled out the folder and it still said Freedom Ride 1971 because as you can see from the slide, it turned out to be a Soviet Jewry Freedom Ride. This was a two month bus trip from Washington DC to Seattle. And on this trip, they staged rallies, they gave speeches to bring social change with the liberation of Jews in the Soviet Union. Of course, here's where we see the influence of civil rights and black power. This bus did not carry black and white Americans testing federal laws on civil rights. These freedom riders lacked training in, from Gandhi and from King. They did not protest the conditions um, of uh, racism for black Americans. Instead, right, they're appealing for the rescue of Soviet Jews. And um, as it turns out, about a quarter of the Soviet Jewry activists trained in the civil rights movement. And I argue that the Soviet Jewry movement would not have happened, or at least not have as successfully as it did, were it not for black power. And here's why. The way the Soviet Jewry movement got political support in Washington was by leveraging Cold War anti-communism, which is a complicated way of saying, it may be hard to get the US Congress and US Senate to pass a resolution supporting Jews somewhere in the world, but it's really easy to get them to pass a resolution against the communists. So if, if you can link something against the communists that helps Jews, that's your political tool. So um, they were able to get the Jackson Bannock amendments. A lot of you may remember that, you know, nearly unanimously passed the US Senate because the Senate was interested in making the communists um, look bad. All right, so here is an historian's question. If you're gonna leverage anti-communism to help get Jews out of the Soviet Union, when should you do that? not in the mid to late 60s and into the 1970s when the Soviet Jewry movement was going. You should do that 10, 15 years earlier, right? In the mid 50s, at the height of McCarthyism. That's when you're gonna get the most political power by being anti-communist. So I ask, why wasn't there a Soviet Jewry movement in the mid 50s? 
The truth is there was, State of Israel was always interested in, in bringing in Soviet Jews. But I argue in the 1950s, most American Jews, white Jews had just you know, entered the suburbs and all they wanted to do was get along in the new neighborhoods that wouldn't allow them to, to, to own homes or vacation in you know, just a few years before. So in the mid 50s, nationwide at least, most white American Jews were doing all they could do to blend in their religious identities to those around them. The Soviet Jewry movement nationalized in 1964. How about that, right? Just at the time black power comes in. And if the black power movement is arguing, you know, um, as, as even Springarn understood in 1914, that leadership must be in the hands of blacks themselves to control their own destinies, right? And, and you've got all these, you know, white Jewish liberal progressive types who are like, what am I going to do, right? Well, you know, they said, okay, um, if black is beautiful, Jewish is beautiful too. And I'm going to go translate what we're doing in the 50s and early 60s in a Jewish way. And since American Jews, white Jews at least, didn't need civil rights in this country, um, Soviet Jews needed a whole lot of civil rights. So they end up protesting in the streets. Um, as uh, Jacob Birnbaum, who is the leader of the student struggle for Soviet Jewry said, many young Jews today forget that if injustice cannot be condoned in Selma, USA, neither must it be overlooked in Kiev. USSR. All right. Zionism. After the uh, 1967 Six Day War, there was an extraordinary increase in enthusiasm um, for Zionism in the United States. And uh, as an observer of this, I found it fascinating because, you know, in 1948, American Jews were thrilled and celebrating, of course, the creation of Israel, relieved uh, just a few years after the Shoah, the Holocaust. Um, but we didn't find in 1948 the kind of public demonstration of Zionism that we found after 1967. 97% um, of American Jews after the Six Day War showed strong sympathy for Israel. Can you imagine? a public opinion poll like that today. In New York City, after the war started, they did a one hour luncheon to raise money, $18 million, and those are 1967 dollars in one hour. UJA doubled its earnings on its Israel emergency campaign the year after that war. 7,500 Jewish college students got on planes, flew to Israel to help the cause. Um, and, and here, um, we see that American Jews were following the lead of black nationalism to say, if black power argues for black liberation and black nationalism, then Jewish nationalism, Zionism in the state of Israel um, is paralleled, right? It is as important to American Jews uh, and could be. And the notion of dual loyalty that was so you know, plaguing earlier generations of American Jews, after black power, the dual loyalty um, concerns dropped you know, significantly because now every ethnic racial gender group out there in the 60s was protesting for whatever their, their, their demands were and they were able to do it without apology. So I found that the uptick and the interest after the Six Day War, well, let's put it this way, the Six Day War was perfectly timed. 1967 was exactly when you would want something like that to occur relative to the rise of black power and identity politics. And then the rabbis, they start their sermons and they start um, going back and forth between the communities. Rabbi Duff Peretz Elkins, um, who is actually a local to you for many years um, in Philadelphia um, and, uh, and later in Princeton, said in one of his sermons, black power is nothing more and nothing less than Negro Zionism. Rabbi Hertzberg, our friend from the earlier slide, Stokely Carmichael, the leader of black power, he called the most radical kind of Negro Zionist. He talks exactly the language of those Jews who felt most violently angry at the sight of Hitler and most hurt by the good people who stood aside. Rabbi Gittleson, the black power advocate is the Negro's Zionist. Africa 
is his Israel. And my favorite part of this chapter, the University of California, Berkeley, my alma mater, started an education abroad program at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem after the Six Day War. And uh, a whole lot of uh, Berkeley students wanted to go to Jerusalem to study, right? And they wanted to be you know, authentic, right? They wanted to go to their roots, their homeland. They wanted to meet their Israeli brothers and sisters. And they showed up on the campus of the Hebrew University with long hair, um, beads, marijuana, bell bottoms, drugs, free sex, right? They had the whole Berkeley in the 60s things going. And when they approached their new Israeli classmates, clean cut, well-dressed, sometimes days off the battlefield, Israel's intellectual elite at the Hebrew University, well, these Israelis looked at the Americans and just thought they were freaks. So if you can imagine the scene between Israeli Jews and American Jews, then we see that what was happening in American Zionism was as much about America in the 60s and ethnic identity from Black power um, as it was about anything we, we might call sort of authentic Judaism. Well, um, there was also a return to tradition. Jews became more ritual bound in their Judaism. Um, a lot of kids became kosher or more kosher than their parents and they wouldn't even go home and eat in their parents' house. They wore more Jewish clothing, uh, kippot, yarmulkes. Um, they changed and used their Hebrew names or even sometimes their Yiddish names if they wanted to. Um, so here's a pop quiz question for you. Um, and this is a Philadelphia-based question too. Um, Jewish Publication Society in Philadelphia, during this era, the most popular book it sold was of course the Hebrew Bible, as it should be. The question is, what was the second most popular book? Think about it. If you're watching with someone, let them know. Otherwise, tell it to the screen. Yep, here it is, the Jewish catalog. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Jewish catalog, it's how to be Jewish with macrame. It was DIY Judaism. And uh, you can see on this one, it says the first, because there was a second Jewish catalog and a third Jewish catalog and a Jewish kids catalog. Why so much interest in the Jewish catalog? Well, here's how it goes. The only reason you buy a Jewish catalog is because you want to do more Jewish things. That's the first thing. Second, if you want to do more Jewish things and you got to buy a book to learn how to do it, it's because you never learned it growing up. There was a generation of young Jews raised in the 50s in an assimilated culture where they didn't learn much Jewish. And then they come through the 60s, and I'm going to argue Black Power and all the other ethnic identity movements that came from it, and they rediscover their Jewishness. And um, this, by the way, is a play on the Whole Earth Catalog, so it's got a countercultural bent to it. And the reason they didn't do a fourth Jewish catalog, at least this is my argument, by the time that many years passed, all the young people that bought this first version, well, when they grew up and had their kids and raised their kids, they gave them Jewish educations and they got to be their parents' age. They don't need no book to tell them how to be Jewish. Um, they were already there. So if you wanna understand the Jewish religious revival, just look at book sale numbers of the Jewish catalog. Well, this is the Berkeley Radical Jewish Student Union. Uh, and uh, I love the photograph. This is Professor David Beal, now of UC Davis, if any of you know him. And uh, you might know a few of the other people as well. And what I loved here is that this group, along with the Stanford Radical Jewish Student Union, um, got together um, to do what would be a sit-in at the Jewish Community Federation in San Francisco, um, playing on the civil rights tactics of direct action protest, but they didn't call it a sit-in. They called it a pray-in. And they showed up Friday afternoon before Shabbat and they prayed, uh, they lit candles, they davened, and they said that they refused to leave until the Jewish Federation that they consider too secular decides to become more Jewish and fund San Francisco's Jewish day school, um, which is amazing. That's on the political left. Um, I'm arguing the Black Power Movement also informed the political right. The Jewish Defense League, led by Amir Kahani, Kahani was a nationalist, he was a racist, um, and he loved um, the Black Panther Party in Oakland. Even though that they were on opposite sides of the political aisle, the notion 
that black Americans were taking up arms to protect their community from the threats around them is exactly what Mayor Kahani wanted to do for the Jews. So I argue that the JDL is a Jewish version of Black Panthers, that Kahani of all people was in fact um, following the lead of the Black Power Movement, even though in most other respects, he disagreed with them. So now our question is, what letter of the alphabet best describes this new historiographic understanding? And all I can say is if we've had an X and a Y already, we're gonna have to go with the Z. And, uh, and here's how it goes. You see, according to this at the top of the Z, blacks and Jews uh, marching together, yay, until the mid sixties. Oh no, the split happens, they break up, they go downward, they go back. But look what's happening now. If um, white Jews and blacks are marching in parallel, right? So they're on the same pathway even though um, they're not actually together. Now, hopefully with the current national reckoning on race, um, with um, much better uh, understandings among white Jews of Jews of color and black Jews, that we are complicating these narratives. We are looking and um, uh, forcing new historiographic interpretations that are gonna be a whole lot more respectful of knowledge that we've even um, been learning so much more in the last two years. Um, but for that, we'll just have to wait for the next generation of graduate students to figure out what book they'd like to write. Thank you so much. And now I'll turn it back to you so we can get to some uh, questions and answers. Okay, welcome back, Professor Dollinger. You know, we're obviously we regret the technological issues, but we're gonna just move directly to Q&A. So folks um, who have many, many questions, uh, there are many, many questions coming in, so we're going to move directly to them. So I'll, I'll ask Dr. Ann Albert to join us. And I want to raise a question um, while you're gone. I, I broached a question in your absence, and I'll re-ask it here, um, which is, since part of the talk is about the historiography, how, how historians describe the past, um, in my very amateurish reading of the historiography, I've noticed that a lot of the scholars doing the work are, seem to be Jewish um, or from the field of Jewish studies. Um, yourself, obviously, Cheryl Greenberg, Jonathan Schorsch, Eric Goldstein, and others. Um, I'm wondering if this is also a topic that um, historians of African American history are also interested in, um, or Black studies, or is this something that Jewish studies scholars are interested in? Is, a, is it a one-sided interest? That is such a great question. The answer is yes, it's one-sided. And the mere fact that it's one-sided itself is, as in, is an expression of the underlying issues which are, which are going on. Um, Jews are very interested in the Black Jewish Alliance. Black folk aren't so interested in the Black Jewish Alliance. So the, the truthfulness of that statement is actually revealing fundamental differences between what it is to be white and Jewish and what it is to be Black in America. And, um, Actually, um, when I was teaching near you uh, early in my career at Bryn Mawr, um, the Jewish student group um, organized a Black Jewish dialogue, right? And they asked me to come and speak to the group. And I just wanted to sort of let the group know that Black Jewish dialogue is very important to, to white Jews. It's, it's not really high on the priority for Blacks. And, you know, don't, don't be surprised or offended if the Black students don't show up, right? No, 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 they're going to show up. So I they wanted me to talk about black Jewish relations. And I showed up with my lesson plan in hand and, and there are only white Jewish students who showed up. And I pulled out my lesson plan and showed them the title, which is why no black students showed up, why you're upset and why we need to talk about that, um, which is to ask how the truthfulness uh, professor of what you just asked is actually revealing of much of the misunderstandings of, of our historical past. Um, and that is that it has not has, it has been a co-equal relationship um, because while Jews, uh, these, are, these are, are white Jews have faced anti-Semitism and horrific anti-Semitism from time to time, um, systemic racism in America and the legacy of slavery has made the African-American experience and the Jewish American experience very different. And it has produced, of course, in our, you know, certainly our undergraduate population now, um, very different um, understandings of themselves, of America, and of their past. And I think all of that comes crashing together 
when inevitably a, um, a white Jewish student asked for black Jewish dialogue. And uh, just to out myself, the preface of the book um, is actually uh, tells a story about how I tried to start a black Jewish dialogue my first year at college at Berkeley and got laughed at by my colleague in the black student union. So I empathize with that question. So I'll turn things over to Anne now. Okay, thank you. I am um, scanning questions desperately as there are many, many really interesting comments and questions. I'll just say first that um, several people have, have suggested in the Q&A different um, potential scholars or thinkers or activists who might qualify as uh, African-Americans who are interested in this relationship. So maybe there's some way of, of sharing, sharing those people. Um, in our resources after. Oh yeah, oh absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I don't mean to say that there aren't any. I, I'm just saying that, thank you. When, but when we look at this um, sort of sociologically um, and, and I'm looking over a broad range of history, it tends to be more uh, of, of, of a white Jewish interest um, than, than it has been a black interest. And certainly on the specific idea of the historiography, um, it's mostly uh, white Jewish scholars who, who are writing about it, um, yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean to suggest otherwise, um, but I but it is you know it's an interesting question to look at each of those people and consider in what ways they're interested in the alliance and in what ways they're maybe just interested in um, Judaism uh, in relation to other religions or, or various kind of like structural overarching things. Um, so, okay, among the questions that we have burning um, in the audience, um, one of them is a question about um, how Jews of color fit into the scenario, the history, and the memory that you've presented here. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, I'd love to, and thank you so much for that question. Um, I finished the book. I sent it in. It didn't have an epilogue. When you write a history book that ends in the contemporary period, for me, it was 1980. You know you need an epilogue, which is like 1980 to the present. It's not scholarly. It's just sort of what's, like what's happened to Blacks and Jews since your book ended. And um, I figured I could get myself like a month or six weeks of a break from writing because it was so intense before I started on the epilogue. And fortunately for me, in that time, I happened to have lunch with a, a friend of mine, Ilana Kaufman. And if you don't know Ilana, Ilana is the uh, founder and executive director of the Jews of Color Initiative. She's a black Jewish woman. And we're having our lunch. And, um, and she, uh, she said to me, she said, Mark, you wrote 200 pages about Blacks and Jews and not a single page about a Black Jew. How could you do that? Well, I gave every defensive from the hip answer I could, right? That's interesting. That's not my book. That's not what I was focusing on. There weren't that many Black Jews. They weren't in the literature. You know, I went through it all. And then we got into it, right? And we got into what historians call causality. What causes history to be what it is? And I argued in this book that being American caused Jews to behave politically more than their Jewishness did. Like that was my first thesis. It's more about America than Jewish. And then my second thesis is it's actually more about the 60s. The political culture of the 60s informed Jews to do things Jewishly that really owe more to the 60s than to Jewish. And then my most pointed part was it's black power. Black power is really the causal agent in historical change. And Alana looked at me and said, go back and reread each of your chapters and ask yourself, other than those three causalities, how much do you think Jewish whiteness actually informed their political opinions and their historical experience? Take a lens of racial equity to your work and see. Now, that points out two things, one, Black Jews had been erased from the historiography, my, my book included. And number two, if we wanna look at Jewish whiteness and racial equity and racial privilege, you don't even need Jews of color for white Jews to self-reflect on that point. And I looked to Ilana and I said, you are right. And that's my epilogue and with her permission and I shared the story with you, I wrote the epilogue around that lunch and around that critique. And I opened by saying that there was a, an X and a Y in the historiography. This Black Power book, I make a Z, which is Blacks and Jews together at the top. Black Power takes us apart and backwards, but then we're going in parallel to one another around ethnic identity. It's the Z. So in the epilogue, I say the next 
the next books got to be probably got to be written by a Jew of color, if not a black Jew. And it's got to have a new causal agent, which is now going to be a lens, uh, a lens of racial privilege. And then we're going to be able to see an old topic in a radically new and different way in a way that even my book doesn't show. That is a really exciting prospect. Um, I want to highlight a question that um, a viewer named Susan submitted. Um, you know, with the issues that you're raising, um, it all feels very contemporary. Um, and you've spoken a little bit about things that are happening on campuses today um, in terms of uh, um, the way people are thinking about these relations. But Susan asked a question about campus activity in the 60s. Um, so she asked, can you speak about what was happening in college campuses in terms of Jewish Black Alliance? In the mid 60s, my personal experience is that um, the relatively few, few black students were members of Jewish fraternities um, because there wasn't a critical mass in that setting to support black fraternities and blacks and Jews were both unwelcome in other contexts. So that's one small um, you know, uh, connection point to this, to this much broader issue of campus radicalism and various kinds of uh, ethnic alliances. Can you, can you tell us about that, putting on your, your historian hat? Yeah, this is a great question. And it's a tricky one because when we talk about the 60s, there's really two periods and, and, and they're only half the 60s, right? So the mid 50s to the mid 60s is you know, what I lovingly call the peace, love and Bobby Sherman. This is when everyone seems to be getting along. This is the King and Heschel years. And then mid 60s to mid 70s, or even up to the election of Reagan in 1980, this, this is when things get militant and violent and things kind of start coming apart. So um, the early part, the first version of the 60s, I think is well described by the question, which is that this is a time when there is interracial alliance. There is a sense of coming together. There is a, a, a hopeful optimism. There is a consensus orientation, which is especially in a Cold War setting, that America is a place where we can be a pluralistic democracy. And all of us, you know, e pluribus unum, all, from, all, from many one. Um, but I'm, what I'm really interested in, though, is what happens in the latter part of the 1960s. And here in the state of California, we're in the middle of a ferocious political debate around ethnic studies. And I think this question really lands right at the center of that. The call for ethnic studies and the call for black studies really came from San Francisco State, where I am, we have the only college of ethnic studies in the country, and Cal Berkeley, which is actually where I did my undergraduate. And the idea here was that students need to center the experience of communities of color. They need to be seen, they need, their, they need to be written, and they need to be understood, especially by, by, by black and brown students, and, and certainly by white students as well. And I argue in the, in the book that Jewish studies as a discipline follows black studies. So even though Jewish studies has largely been the study of white Jewish people, right, um, it, it owes its existence to the notion that it is okay in a university setting for one ethnic racial gender group to focus only on itself. And I would argue all of the ethnic studies really followed from black studies, women's studies in the 1970s also was an outgrowth. Um, I write in the introduction to the book that I think black power inspired all these identity groups to um, learn about themselves, right? Everyone owes a debt to black power. Now I did the Jewish book because that's my field, but I think scholars and other ethnic and, and gender um, specialties um, could write their own version. That is a really helpful framing for me actually. Um, I just want to ask really quickly, a couple of people have asked for some clarification about what you mean about the peace, love, and Bobby Sherman. Who, who, can, you, can you contextualize who Bobby Sherman is and what yeah. you're talking about there? Bobby Sherman was a, was a pop singer in that era, and he sang love songs, and everybody held hands and got along. There's, there's two basic theories in history, and I think maybe in our worldview. One is that we all basically tend to get along, and occasionally we fight. And the other is we all basically tend to fight and occasionally we get along, you know, I, that's terribly reductionist, but, but essentially I find that, that academic historians and even people tend, tend to be framed that way. So I, so I see the sort of the Bobby Sherman as, as a consensus model. And the idea that in the early years after World War II, and, and now I'll get to what my thesis was to explain 
all of those documents. Um, when we were at war, at a Cold War with the communists, we needed to show that our democracy works. And the way you show our democracy works is you show that everybody gets along. So when Elijah Muhammad of the Nation of Islam says something anti-Semitic, and it was anti-Semitic and he said it, don't move him to the center. Don't give him platform. Don't show the communists anything about a radical fringe, black, militant, ideological, anti-Semitic, anti-white group. The best way you deal with them is deplatform them, marginalize them, and silence them. And that's what we did from 1945 to let's say 1965, right? The, the, the consensus part. But once the consensus broke in the mid 60s and conflict came, the Vietnam War, right? That's, that also played into this. Now, you don't want to marginalize the Nation of Islam, which now became Malcolm X and later Louis Farrakhan. You want to center them. You want to put them there because it is about conflict. So my overarching thesis is that this is not about the Nation of Islam. They've always been anti-Semitic. They've been consistent in their anti-Semitism. This is about how Jewish leaders have flipped their response to the anti-Semitism in order to track a larger national trend, either towards consensus in the Cold War period or conflict in the late 60s. OK, so actually, there are two questions that I want to combine together that follow up on, on what you just said pretty, um, pretty closely. OK, so Linda asked, was there a comparable emergence of Jewish anti-Black racism in response to the rise of Black militarism and Black power? Um, so is it sort of like uh, there was racism all along among white American Jews um, and then it was noticed or was there a, a response and a kind of increase in, in racist attitudes? Um, and then Karen asked, um, a kind of uh, other side of the coin question, is it possible that white Jews lack of recognition of their own whiteness and white privilege rather than the black power movement in itself caused that rift in the mid 60s? Mid -60s? Yeah, thank you. Let me get that second question first because that, that really, that's such a good question. And yeah, I, I certainly, well, it's, it's huge. I, I don't know that I wanna compare it. I think they were acting in concert. This is what's so tough. Um, about racial status and, and white Jews because, and, and I'll self-identify, right, as a white Jew, we have not been considered white. Even in American history, we haven't. And there are times we have. Um, Eric Goldstein, you know, has a great book, The Price of Whiteness on this. Karen Brodkin also has a good book on this, How Jews Became White Folks. And um, it's a fascinating story to present as white and at times not to be considered or treated as white and then other times too, because it's, all right. And, and with this, it's a moving target as an historian to try to line everything up. Um, so yes, so even till today, we have a challenge with what do you do with a group that does not self-identify as white, even though the privilege is conferred upon them. And as I say, like I walk into 7-Eleven back when I could do that, I don't get followed around you know, by the police, by the security guard, and, and that's not anything I did anything about to have happen, right? Because I just got that. So, um, so I think that a big difference between 50 years ago and today is this recognition that racism is systemic, that privilege is conferred, that Jews, even as we not only suffer sporadic anti-Semitism, but the last five years has been the worst anti-Semitic incidences in American Jewish history. We have you know, Pittsburgh and Poway, we've had Jews killed while they were praying. This is unheard of, right? And that goes alongside a system of white supremacy, which um, Jews have benefited from at least since 1945. And here's the tricky part, even though white supremacists wanna kill Jews oh my goodness, how do we navigate through all of those different categories? On the first part of your question, yes, there's always been Jews engaged in, in you know, um, fighting against um, you know, um, racism at all points. Um, I've been trying to track sort of what the dominant themes have been um, as, as, as sort of national Jewish organizations did it just to, to try to get a sense of, of what the pulse was. Thank you. Oh. Should, oh, do we need to wrap up, Steve? We need to wrap up, unfortunately, but I um, wanted to thank Professor Dolliger. You know, we're sorry about the technical issues, but we learned a lot from your presentation and from the Q&A. Um, I'm hoping you're able to join my class in a few minutes. 
Um, but I want to thank the audience, obviously, for your patience, too. And um, as I was saying um, earlier, this is one of a number of talks that we will be having that will be focused on, on the intersection of Blackness and Jewishness or Blacks and Jews. And, um, and, and, and Professor Dollinger has really made a very important contribution. So I want to recommend his book very strongly to you if you can acquire a copy. And um, I want to invite you back next week with Professor Sylvester Johnson, who will be talking about this from a different angle. And I want to finally again thank Professor Dollinger for you know, a great presentation and great responses to the questions. So thank you all, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>